He is perhaps the only engineer in history whose name is renowned world over. It's really quite unique to be remembered like that in the construction, engineering or technical industries. A metal magician, Gustav Eiffel was one of the most illustrious stars of the 19th century and one of those who brought France into the modern era. He finds himself with metal building blocks, blocks you have to put together, and he discovers that with these blocks he can do extraordinary things. It was the IKEA of the times. He built each project in a way that was extremely organized. When we look at Eiffel's creations, we can see that each project made improvements on the last. A genius in the world of technology, who aside from his famous tower, which has become a symbol of Paris, dreamed up and built thousands of metal structures over a period of more than 30 years and spanning five continents in Europe, Asia, Africa and even the Americas. Viaducts, bridges, stations, observatories, but also the structure of the famous Statue of Liberty. Gustave Eiffel was also a tireless researcher who continuously strove to improve the technologies available at the time, such as the technique for installing bridge decks. He worked his whole life on and was passionate about science and progress. Eiffel was a man who was constantly innovating with regard to his construction methods and the execution of his plans. Gustave Eiffel spent his whole life innovating and inventing with one sole obsession to go down in history. It was supposed to be taken down after the World Exposition of 1889. But today it is impossible to imagine Paris without this tower, Gustave Eiffel's masterpiece. If I make two lines like that, you immediately recognize the outline of the Eiffel Tower. It's a very powerful logo, and this tower stays in our psyche as a symbol of daring. Every year, Seven million people come to visit this symbol and to marvel at the metal lacework, which is so light that if you were to melt the Eiffel Tower down into one big 125 meter squared metal plate, you'd have a plate of only six centimeters thick, so there really isn't much metal in this tower, or far less than you'd imagine. But whilst everyone knows the Eiffel Tower, few know about the man behind it. Gustave Eiffel was born in Dijon in 1832. In the Eiffel household, it was his mother, Catherine Melanie, who was the head of the family. Melanie was a woman with a strong character, the daughter of a wood merchant, and she could sense that things were changing with the Industrial Revolution, so she decided to invest in the coal industry. Gustave's father was somewhat of an idealist, and so Gustave Eiffel inherited traits from both. To his parents' great satisfaction, the young Gustave proved to be a talented student. After finishing secondary school, he headed to Paris, enrolled in the École Centrale des Arts et Manufactures, and graduated as an engineer in 1855. Now a graduate, Gustave began to look for his first job, and found one thanks to his mother's connections. He started working for Charles Neveu an independent engineer who had himself graduated from the École Centrale several years earlier. The relationships Eiffel makes are very important. He starts working with iron because Nevu deals in metal construction and so begins his story with metal. But which metal in particular? At the beginning of the 19th century, France launched its industrial revolution. Thanks to the steam engine and energy from coal, the metal industry began to develop and new materials appeared on the scene, which were all a mix of coal and iron ore at different concentrations. The number one metal used for construction at the end of the 18th century was cast iron. A cast iron column, that is 10 centimeters in diameter, is able to support the same weight in a structure as a stone column that is 80 centimeters thick. However, this new material quickly displayed certain limitations. Cast iron is tough and strong, but it cracks easily, isn't very flexible and is not easy to assemble. 
you really do need a certain flexibility because a bridge, for example, that is completely rigid will break from one day to the next. Rigid and brittle, cast iron cannot withstand tensile forces, so they needed to invent something else. Gustavi Fell went with wrought iron, which was to become his building material of choice. It's an alloy created by refining cast iron. It involves heating the cast iron, melting it down, and puddling it, or working it with tools, which result in a certain purification and the removal of all excess carbon in the cast iron. And this wrought iron had certain mechanical properties which were much more suited to construction. It is extremely strong for its weight. It also has a certain flexibility and can therefore withstand compressive stresses, as well as bending and tensile forces. Metal construction really took off with the invention of wrought iron, and also with that of the rolling mill, a type of press which is used to flatten the metal. So that is why Eiffel and his contemporaries championed wrought iron. And the young employee, Gustave Eiffel, was soon to get his first opportunity to demonstrate his potential. His boss was working on an exciting venture, a metal railway bridge in Bordeaux on the Garonne River. But at the site in question, the project came up against a significant challenge. The Garonne was at its deepest 10 meters deep and the ground was unstable. How were they to erect the pillars for the future bridge under such conditions? In order to win the contract, Neveux and Eiffel proposed an avant-garde technical method, previously tested in mines where there was a problem of water in the tunnels. So the method was called the Trigère method, and it was indeed used on the construction of the bridge at Bordeaux. Trigère was a French geologist, to whom Eiffel would pay homage some years later. His name appears amongst those of the 72 scholars inscribed on the first floor of the Eiffel Tower. Gustave Eiffel found himself alone in charge of this project, for which he had not drawn up the plans himself. He had to apply this method of using compressed air in order to work below the waterline and dig the foundations of the bridge. It's still complicated even today to work in water, but back then these were completely new challenges for which he was practically inventing things on the spot. Up until then, the only solution for building the foundations of a bridge across a river was to build dams upstream of the building site. Such constructions were both long and expensive, but this time Gustave Eiffel had another ingenious idea. Using barges, Eiffel brought in cast iron rings, assembled together into a big hollow tube, a dozen meters long. This tube was the base of a future bridge pier. It was dropped into the water in a vertical position. The bottommost ring had sharp edges to make it easier to entrench in the riverbed. The interior of the tube was separated into three compartments. The one at the top was open to the air. The one at the bottom was a watertight chamber where compressed air was injected at a pressure of three or four bars. This compressed air repelled the water in the chamber and stopped it from getting into the other compartments. The workers then went down into the bottom chamber and were able to dig the ground in this pressurized space. They sent the rubble upwards to the central chamber using a sluice system where other workers were waiting to discard it via the top of the tube. They were working dry in these sort of airtight chambers. It was very tiring work. They were constantly rotating 24-7. But Eiffel was still not completely satisfied with this already innovative method. To make it even more efficient, he perfected it by installing a hydraulic press at the top of the tube. The resulting pressure facilitated the sinking of the tube and consequently saved precious time. Eiffel was a man who was constantly innovating with regard to his construction methods and the execution of his plans. With the first bridge piers, they were digging 20 centimeters under the riverbed a day. With the introduction of Eiffel's method, that increased to a meter a day. In the last stage, once they'd hit solid ground, 15 meters down into the riverbed, Eiffel had them fill the tubes with cement. 
they thus became the 12 pillars which would support the metal structure of the bridge. The second big innovation in the construction of the bridge was the choice of using an open tunnel. You would really have got a sense of lightness in 1858-1860 on seeing this tunnel gradually being built. The bridge in Bordeaux was one of the first of the big French bridges to be built using this lattice technology, with vertical posts and crossbox, which was therefore much lighter. At the time it was completely spectacular. Everyone was eager to visit this bridge, to witness this new method of metal bridge building. In this project, we can see the starting point of Gustave's unique stamp. It's really an architectural alphabet that he went on to use in all his bridge building projects. Using this technique, Gustave Eiffel had a big advantage over his competitors. His solution was far less expensive in raw materials. This financial advantage allowed him to win many new contracts. And Gustave Eiffel chose rivets rather than bolts to hold together the different pieces of the lattice structure. Hot riveting is yet another technology that he adopted, promoted and used in all of his constructions. When we look at Eiffel's creations, we know that the solutions he brought to them were always the best. And what makes him different is precisely the fact that the technical solutions he used were very innovative. So two metal plates are attached by the rivet, and when the metal cools down, it contracts and the plates are held together very solidly. Impossible to separate. The advantage of riveting is that the pieces don't move independently from each other, which allows for a greater solidity and more robustness in the constructions. We can see this in constructions which are over 100 years old but are still standing. The rivet is this peg with a head on one end, which you heat at a temperature of 1200 degrees. Nowadays, only a few teams still master this highly technical method passed down through the centuries. There's one person who is at the forge. Then there's a second person who takes the hot rivet and puts it into position. Afterwards, there's a third person who shapes the second head of the rivet with a riveting hammer, which forms the second round head you can see on the other side. This process is still very similar to what they did in the 19th century. In Bordeaux, Eiffel experimented with one last method which would become one of his signatures. He entered the dawn of standardization. From this project on, only a few pieces of metal and a few base structures, namely brackets at a right angle and X-shaped braces, would be assembled and their pattern repeated throughout his constructions. The standardization is really interesting. Put simply, it was the mechanization of his projects, and the idea came to him right there on the building site. He was innovating with each project. He finds himself with metal building blocks, blocks you have to put together, and he discovers that with these blocks he can do extraordinary things. It was the IKEA of the times. He built each project in a way that was extremely organized. In less than two years, Eiffel delivered the bridge respecting both the budget and the deadline. Until 2008, almost 150 years later, it remained the only railway bridge in Bordeaux. I think that with this bridge, he really learned what it meant to be an entrepreneur and a manufacturer. It was both a technical and human success for Eiffel. His first great success, I would say. He became incredibly well known after that. And as a result of the bridge, people came to him looking to reproduce his technical methods. After the building works at Bordeaux, Eiffel had definitely earned his stripes and also the trust of the decision makers. He was awarded other construction projects throughout the Southwest, but was already thinking about his next move, becoming his own boss. In 1866, at barely 33 years old, he set up his own company, Gustave Eiffel Builder, and established workshops and a factory at Le Velois Perret. He was the designer. He built the pieces and he put them together. He was in charge of every step of the process, and it was obviously very new in comparison to what he'd done before. Eiffel was a man who was very self-assured. He was very confident both in his capabilities and in his judgment. 
He was also very interested in the financial and legal aspects of his projects, and I think that Eiffel was born with that, that it was in his genes. But in order to develop as quickly as possible, Eiffel needed an associate. He found this associate in a man named Théophile Seyrig, who had a private fortune and was therefore able to help set up a company. At the same time, he was also a very talented engineer. Théophile Seyrig graduated first in his class from the École Centrale, so he was a very talented engineer, and this association was to be a very fruitful one. It lasted several very decisive years for Eiffel's career. He had a talent for surrounding himself with the best, and that was an indisputable talent. Eiffel was, however, the only boss, a fact which is clear and written in black and white on the contract of his association with Sirik. Thanks to the contacts he made in Bordeaux, Eiffel landed his first big contract, two very tall viaducts in the Allier area. For the first time, metal is chosen for economic reasons, because at that height, masonry work would have been more expensive. Here we have the first construction built by Eiffel, just after creating his own company. It's 180 meters long and 59 meters high. Previous to these building works, there had been only two metal viaducts built in France. But with all due respect to those entrepreneurs and designers, they were really nothing in comparison to this. The four curves that you see at the bottom were to bring a certain stability to the structure and to provide resistance against the wind. The engineer in him solved a technical problem and the architect, which he was at the time, gave it its elegance. It's a shape which somewhat preludes the future shapes of the Eiffel Tower and at the same time it's the same principal stability. Nowadays, the Rousard viaduct and the Nevial viaduct are still used by the trains running between Clermont-Ferrand and Montluçon. At the time of their construction, he fell once again impressed with his daring and applied for his first patent of invention. He applied for around 30 over the course of his lifetime, and this first patent was for the technique which was called bridge launching. Launching a bridge was a process which consisted of installing a deck, the horizontal part of the bridge, on top of the piers which were going to support it. This was a dangerous and extremely delicate process. They built it on the riverbank, which was an easy process, and then just had to find the means of shifting the bridge, of pushing it forward, both efficiently and without causing any harm or damage. There were 40 to 60 workers on the deck. They took hold of the big seven-meter wooden levers and with a one, two, three, and push! One, two, three, and push! They moved the deck forward centimeter by centimeter. As it was very solid, they could move it forward 50 to 60 meters into mid-air without it breaking. And Eiffel made improvements in the way they pushed the deck. It wasn't easy. It was heavy. The weight wasn't the only problem. Until the bridge was in its final position, the first piers risked collapsing from the strain. Eiffel came up with a solution, a rocking frame, a sort of cart with the wheels facing upwards, over which the deck was then slid. Before Eiffel came along, they managed a maximum of 50 centimetres a day, but now they were able to considerably multiply the progress, so that was really very significant. With Eiffel's invention, they were managing more than five meters a day. So this is when Eiffel showed that he had yet another talent, a talent for communication, doing something well and explaining how to do it well. He already knew how to do things well, and here he showed that he was also very good at explaining it. The success of these two projects confirmed the Eiffel company's place as one of the leading builders of the day. As France tipped towards an economic depression following defeat in the War of 1870, Gustave Eiffel was himself multiplying his turnover by four and set out to conquer the world. Most notably, he landed the order for the magnificent Budapest Western Railway Station in Hungary. It was very innovative, very harmonious. It has a very large skylight, and then on both sides there are buildings which are made of stone and brick. 
Whilst the glass, the brick and the workforce were all local, the 1,500 tonnes of cast iron and iron needed for the build came along with the foreman directly from Eiffel's workshops at Le Valois Perret. Eiffel didn't trust anybody but himself, his own employees and his own construction workers. He saved money by calculating really precisely the quantity of metal he needed. He prepared the pieces in his factory and had a policy of zero error. All of this was part of Eiffel's perfectionist organization and was, without a doubt, one of the keys to his success. This metal, which had traveled 1,500 kilometers from France, was displayed on view throughout, which was a real revolution at the time in this type of building. So you have to admit that this station is very particular, given that at the time, metal was considered an engineer's material, which was ugly and not to be put on show. And while in Budapest the metal plays an essential structural role, it also plays an aesthetic one. And it was the first time that he could say, all you architects can see that I can use an engineer's metal, but with the metal, I can also propose architectural forms that you cannot build. In the wake of Budapest, Eiffel built stations and covered markets throughout Europe and even as far as Peru. Then in 1875, his company landed the second biggest order in its history, to build a bridge in Porto, Portugal. Eiffel won the contract by proposing an innovative design, but also a budget that was three times cheaper than that of his competitors. So they all said that it wasn't possible. So the calculations were verified by other engineers and everyone was forced to agree that indeed it was possible and that he was very much ahead of his competitors. The bridge, named the Maria Pia Bridge, is a bridge in the form of an arch and its design was signed by Théophile Serig, Eiffel's associate. The arch is a well-known shape in the world of architecture, but this time the dimensions went beyond all those previously achieved. The bridges that were built at the time were 50, 70, 100 metres long, but this one had a central span of 160 metres. He really captured people's attention and showed that he could go well beyond what was already being done at the time. It was a project that, as all the others before it, was technically irreproachable, innovative, cheaper than others and built to schedule. So here is a moment of glory. And this glory paved the way for yet more. The legend of Gustave Eiffel was born. In 1878, shortly after the inauguration of the bridge in Porto, a young graduate from the École Polytechnique, also a bridge and roadway engineer, wrote to him. Léon Bouillet was in charge of constructing the railway line between Marvejol in Lozère and Nassag in Cantal. So here we're in the massive Central region. And you have to understand that for centuries, it was really complicated to put communication channels in the Massif Central. There is a very particular topography, which was a real conundrum for the engineers at the time. Eiffel replied to Boyer. The two men exchanged drawings and ended up with a project heavily influenced by the Maria Pia Bridge. But in order for the trains to traverse the Truyère Gorge at the Garabi site, the dimensions had to be even more ambitious. They had to cross half a kilometre of gorge. The challenge was colossal and almost unachievable. A challenge in terms of men as well as logistics. Garabi was in the middle of nowhere and with poor access, 30 kilometres from the nearest station. At the time, Eiffel was really in the spotlight the world over. And it just seemed obvious that only Eiffel's company would be able to take on this project. There was in fact no bid solicitation, and they handed the direct contract of the bill to Eiffel, which is something very exceptional, and that you can't find in the case of other viaducts. 
It's very interesting for Eiffel, as it's a bridge, which on the one hand he's already done, but also there isn't any competition, so he can fix any price which seems reasonable to him. This is when he falls out with his associate, because Sirik says, yes, but wait, if we're redoing the Porto Bridge, well, I was the one who designed the Porto Bridge, so I would like to have some investment in Garibi, especially given that it looks like a good deal. Eiffel refused and ended their business association. He hired a new engineer for his office and decided to improve the Garabi project without simply copying what they had done in Porto. The two bridges are extremely similar, but there are, however, certain details that are different, details that have been improved. That was really Eiffel's trademark. He could have taken the same system used at Porto and brought it to this site, but instead he took the opportunity to make even more improvements. Here at Garabi, everything is out of the ordinary. The arch peaks at 120 meters from the ground, which was a record at the time, and no one had ever built a viaduct with such reach. 165 meters spanned in one go. The building site opened in August 1880. 3,000 tons of metal beams were dispatched to the site. The 20,000 meters cubed of masonry granite came from Lazare, 15 or so kilometers away. The materials were transported in carts pulled by cattle and horses. To put this bridge together, Eiffel applied a technique developed with his team. It was a totally innovative method, and it was what allowed him to be three times less expensive than his competitors in Portugal. Eiffel was the only person in the world capable of carrying out this method on this scale. The technique was called cantilever mounting. Cantilever mounting is a technique for connecting two halves of an arch, starting on opposite riverbanks and meeting in midair. The arches are held up at each stage of their progression by cables, here in yellow which are attached to the part of the bridge which is already built. These cables prevent the arch from tipping into the river during the construction phase. The last piece installed thus becomes the departure point for the next and the arch is built without the need for scaffolding. This results in a huge saving which explains the rates Eiffel was able to offer in Porto. Small cranes are moved about as required to put the next pieces into position. For this, they use the simple wooden gantry at Garibi and barges on the river at Porto. The joining of the two sides of the arch is a crucial moment in the process. Everything gets to the middle and comes together as if by magic. It's quite magical. And so they had managed this construction with a total mathematical precision. It was conceived like that. It was assembled perfectly and the two sides came together to fit perfectly. During the four years of construction, the newspapers documented the progress of the building works and Gustave Eiffel gradually gained a new status. After Garabi, he didn't know where to start. There were orders flooding in from everywhere. And obviously his reputation as the man who can resolve the most difficult of problems, as the master of iron, was a reputation solidly affirmed. The organization of the Garabi build, along with the meticulous preparation of each and every element of this giant puzzle, proved to be decisive. Eiffel and his team even added a new concept to increase productivity during the assembly. Only 250,000 rivets were inserted in situ. The other half were put in place beforehand in the factory. Regarding the standardization of the pieces, Eiffel had now added a prefabrication element, which saved valuable time during the assembly. This, therefore, gave Eiffel a good idea. He said to himself, if we can do that for big viaducts, we can also do that for little bridges. And so he began to develop a system of portable bridges which were shipped in kits. 
So he spent at least eight years researching, carrying out trials, looking to find the ideal number of pieces required to create these famous flat pack bridges. Each piece was under 70 kilos, and there were only a dozen different pieces, like a Meccano, but a bit reduced. You could fabricate bridges of 6 meters, 9 meters, up to 40 meters, and which could be assembled by small teams of a dozen workers who didn't necessarily have to be qualified. And so he filled that gap in the market. From an architect's point of view, it didn't bring any value. But it did, however, make him a huge fortune. 1884 is a key year for Gustave Eiffel. Garabi is completed to great fanfare, and with the spread of colonization, his flat pack bridges are exported in large numbers. The order books are full, the company's revenue secured for several decades. But for the first time, he comes up against failure. There's an accident on one of his building sites, and this drama is to have enormous repercussions on the future. Evolebin in the Creuse area. This is the Tard Viaduct, a bridge which is simple in comparison with that at Garabi, but whose central span is exceptionally long. 100 meters between two stone piers, which was a new record at the time. During the night of the 26th to the 27th of January, 1884, the wind rose whilst the deck was in the process of being launched and bouncing 50 meters over the void. One stormy, thundery night, the metal part of the viaduct got caught up by the wind, by a hurricane, and was thrown down into the valley. It was a rather serious and important accident for the company. For Eiffel, the fact that there was no loss of life was in itself very important. But what had happened? So there was an inquiry commission charged with finding out what happened. And the inquiry concludes that there was a storm with exceptionally strong winds, which resulted in the collapse of the structure, and therefore there was no one to blame. But Eiffel has learned nonetheless that even on a lattice structure, an open structure, which seems very light and very transparent, even on a structure such as that, the wind can have a considerable impact. And I think that this explains all the work that he carried out regarding this problem after his career as a builder. For Eiffel, it was out of the question that this kind of accident should happen again. Any further drama could ruin his career. So he got back to work to improve his techniques even further, personally rechecking the calculations of the constructions he'd already built and going over the plans for future constructions in order to ensure even less susceptibility to wind pressure. And one major project would allow him to put this newfound knowledge to the test. It's 1884, and his design office is putting the finishing touches to the frame of the Statue of Liberty. Three years earlier, the sculptor Auguste Bartholdi had asked Eiffel to design the structure of this monumental statue, which the French people were going to gift the United States. Eiffel jumped at the opportunity. 46 meters high, this work of art, enveloped in a copper exterior, was going to be placed in an area which was very exposed to the wind. They had never built a statue so big, obviously, so they had to find the right method. This statue is covered in quite a thin copper skin, and in order to support a statue of this height, you need something on the inside, otherwise the skin will collapse. He realized that the project of the Statue of Liberty in New York was something that people were going to talk about, of course. And so when Bartholdi asked him to come up with the structure that can support his statue, he cannot refuse. It may have been an unexceptional technical object, but it was going to be placed at the entrance to New York Harbour. If we remove the outer layer of the Statue of Liberty, we indeed find a technical object that is wholly unexceptional for Eiffel. The basis of his business even, the ABC of his constructions. It's a bridge pier whose shape has been adapted to that of a statue, obviously, but a bridge pier nonetheless. A simple bridge pylon which is quite similar in shape to those at the Garabi viaduct. In the centre, it's a pylon, like a very classic bridge pylon. 
with four sides, cross pieces, cross bucks, lending a strong rigidity to the pylon, which is then anchored in a stone base. Built over the top of this pylon, there is a secondary structure, much lighter than the first. And attached to this secondary structure, there are bars which connect the secondary structure to the copper skin. The bars are quite flexible to allow this copper skin to move a little, to withstand the wind. It can distort its shape very slightly and relay this distortion to the central pylon which remains rigid. What is very amusing is that when you look at the Statue of Liberty, you get the impression that it is solid, that it's hard. In fact, the statue is only 2.5 millimeters thick. It's just a thin copper skin. This skin is made up of 300 sheets of copper. The construction was first assembled in Paris and then shipped in crates to New York, where it was reassembled and inaugurated in 1886. From that moment on, Eiffel no longer had to go looking for contracts. The contracts came to him. His team were now experienced and loyal after working with him on several construction sites, and Eiffel would therefore be able to rely on the talent of his team to realize the greatest project of his life. It is now the mid-1880s. Paris and France decide to apply to be hosts for the next Universal Exposition that will take place five years later. So they said, well, we need a technical exploit. It seems that for over 20 or 30 years, in the engineering world, they had been asking themselves, will we one day be able to build a tower 1,000 feet tall, 300 and something meters? Various teams had already tried in England, in the United States, in Washington in particular, but no one had succeeded. At the time, the tallest building in the world was the obelisk in Washington, which stands at 169 meters tall. And inside Eiffel's workshops, there are two engineers working away in their corner. And one day they go and show Eiffel their project designs, and they tell him they can do it. These two engineers are Gustave Eiffel's right-hand men. The head of his design studio, Maurice Cochlin, recruited following the departure of Théophile Serig, and Émile Nouguier, the great organizer of all of the company's building sites. Coquelin had just finished working on the Statue of Liberty, and he proposed, along with Nouguier, the very simple shape of a big vertical pylon. Everything is there, yet nothing is there. That is to say, the idea has been presented, but there's a lot of work to do on a technical level, and the shape is still rather unpolished. So they started off with a sort of inverted V shape, all straight with straight lines, an isosceles triangle with the point at the top. Not very delicate and not very pretty to look at. Eiffel looked at it and said, well, that's not a very accomplished project. And he recommended that they give it a slightly more aesthetic aspect. But most of all, he started thinking straight away about wind resistance. Cochlan and Nouguier are asked to go over their design. They rework their project with the help of architect Stéphane Sauvest, who adds decorative arches, dresses the feet with masonry, reduces the number of levels, installs a dome at the summit, and then the men go back to Eiffel. This sketch is an extrapolation of what the company knows how to build, bridge pylons taking into consideration the effects of the wind. With a curved shape, the horizontal effect of the wind is redirected by following the shape of the curve. So the shape of the curve is derived from said calculations. At that moment, Gustav Eiffel understands that his engineers are developing something which is absolutely possible to realize and which could be incorporated in the Exposition Universelle of 1889. That's when the Eiffel machine really gets going. He believes so strongly in the idea that he takes out a patent with his engineers for a 300-meter-tall tower in order to protect the idea. That also shows his well-developed business sense. So once again, Eiffel and his engineers start from what they know best, bridge piers. Bridge piers played a really important role in Eiffel's career. He acquired a certain knowledge through building bridges that he was later able to transfer to ever more complex constructions. 
Essentially, all the technology required for the Eiffel Tower already exists. There is no major technological innovation in the tower. There is obviously a breakthrough in terms of the height and in the shape of the tower, built for greatest wind resistance, but in the construction itself there is nothing innovative. It is precisely that which allows Eiffel to risk building the tower. It's innovative in the sense that it's 300 meters tall at the end of the day. He's still the first to have dared try it. It's a sort of great synthesis of everything he had done before. Whilst public opinion and political influence proved generally favorable, Eiffel nevertheless encountered strong opposition from certain intellectuals who described the tower as horrific, useless and monstrous. Gustave Eiffel was undeterred and financed out of his own pocket or by means of a loan two-thirds of the construction, nearly six million francs. In exchange, the city of Paris granted him an operating concession for the duration of 20 years. He would be able to do whatever he wanted, charge people to go up the tower, use the tower for restaurants or other sorts of commercial activities, under the understanding that at the end of the 20 years, the tower would be taken down. It was a temporary construction, an object for entertainment. The construction itself would last two years, two months and five days. Under the watchful eyes of the Parisians, Gustave Eiffel once again implemented the technology that had launched his career. For the two pillars next to the Seine, where the water from the river encroached on the site, he dug the foundations using chambers of compressed air. He also used wrought iron and the riveting technique he knew so well. The only moment of stress in the assembly of the 18,000 pieces was the juncture of the four feet at the first floor. They had to connect them all together. It had to be exactly level. And they weren't just dealing with two junctures, but four, and they needed to be fitted together very precisely. The difficulty was the same as with the bridges, but multiplied by four. The construction starts with four feet, which are joined together by enormous girders, which are, I believe, seven meters tall. The first floor is a stall with four feet. The second floor is a second stall placed on top of the first, and from the second to the summit, it's just a simple bridge pier, nothing more. But at the same time, they couldn't forget that the tower had to be fit for visits, and if they wanted to attract a significant number of visitors, they had to bring something new to the structure, and that was the lifts. The hydraulic lifts with a piston were a complete novelty at the time. No one had ever built lifts to a height of 300 meters. Whilst they had already mastered the technique for erecting a tower 300 meters tall, the lifts were key in succeeding in the commercial challenge. Eiffel, therefore, had to come up with truly revolutionary lifts. Driven by steam engines, they had to carry 10,000 people a day up and down inclines which differed in angle between each level. The lift's doors had to be able to alter their position so as not to topple everyone inside when transporting them to the top. It was a completely crazy challenge to even think about being able to do it. 130 years later, in the east pillar of the Eiffel Tower, the original technology is still in use. Only the cabin has been changed, and the steam engine replaced by electricity in operating the water pumps, which in turn power the piston. There have been a few modifications for security reasons, but we're not let off that easily. I would say the majority of pieces are original. It's a wonderful machine. We call it a pulley block of eight. One meter of piston movement gives you eight meters of cabin travel. With the length of this piston, they can raise the cabin up to the second floor, 157 meters up. To get up to the third floor, other lifts take over. What's incredible is that during the six months of the exposition, he almost completely recoups his costs. With the price of riding in the lift and the different little activities on sale at the tower, he breaks even in a matter of months. With this tower, Eiffel became the star of the Exposition Universelle. 
When the Exposition Universelle was inaugurated, after the completion of the tower, Gustave Eiffel became the most well-known and respected engineer, both in France and the whole world. It was almost instantaneous as the tower shared his name, the Eiffel Tower. That is very rare. He didn't name Eiffel Tower the Eiffel Tower. The project was called the 300-metre tower. It came to be called the Eiffel Tower because the people just started calling it that. Gustave Eiffel has reached the height of his career as a builder. The tower was to be both his masterpiece and his final project. Yet at 57 years old, he makes the first wrong move of his career. He agrees to participate in building the 10 locks of the Panama Canal. The project is in a bad way. It has accumulated delays and over-expenditures. But the hope is to get going again with the help of Gustave Eiffel, and he has offered a fortune to come on board. He signs a contract which is worth 15 times more than the tower. It's an enormous contract. He receives a down payment of 30%, and with that, he sets to work and starts to build the lock gates. But Eiffel's involvement is not enough to avoid bankruptcy and the ruin of hundreds of thousands of small shareholders who had invested all of their savings in the project. The Panama scandal was huge. Those responsible had to be held to account. Along with the bankruptcy came other revelations of bribery, corruption and misappropriation of funds. The politicians involved were brought down one by one. Eiffel also found himself in the dock. He is sentenced to two years in prison, although he only does a dozen or so days, and it is an injury from which he will never fully recover. Gustave Eiffel would finally be cleared in 1893 by the Court of Cassation, but this injury had profound repercussions. He doesn't want anything more to do with the world of construction, nothing to do with the world of politics, and he becomes a sort of grumpy old man who is both surly and reclusive. Gustave Eiffel retires from business, but he doesn't stay resentful for long. Totally determined to prevent the destruction of his tower, he embarks upon a new career. It had no real utility, so Eiffel had to find a scientific use for it. He was an engineer, after all. And he hadn't lost sight of the idea that the tower could be used for something other than just receiving the public. From 1898, Gustave Eiffel financed and hosted at his tower various scientific experiments, including the first French radio contact, realized by Eugène Ducreté. Very quickly, the Tower's communications centre began to contact areas further and further away, from 400 kilometres to as far as Canada. They were able to send transmissions very far. And these experiences were so successful that they ensured the Eiffel Tower would never be torn down. And he won. It's still there. Being a giant antenna, 300 metres tall, the Eiffel Tower is saved for good. But Eiffel's scientific spirit is not satisfied. The scholar needs to continue his research. So the next thing he does is create the foundations of meteorology. He uses the Eiffel Tower as an observation post. And over many, many years, he publishes the world's first weather atlases. In the end, he made a name for himself as the true founder of the science. The last field in which Gustave Eiffel will leave his mark stems from one night in January 1884, when one of his viaducts collapsed during construction due to an onslaught of wind. Gustave Eiffel dedicated the last 30 years of his life to wind and to wind resistance. He designed a wind tunnel, which even more so than his tower, allowed him to analyze all the parameters of wind and to study its effect on different objects. So this wind tunnel is something quite extraordinary. It has been working continuously since its inauguration on the 2nd of January 1912, and we are still carrying out aerodynamic tests in this wind tunnel to this day. It is worth noting that he was 79 years old when he built this machine and started using it. Gustave Eiffel's static tests would go on to play a decisive role in the emerging field of aviation development, a discipline he was passionate about. Gustave Eiffel allowed all those wishing to build aeroplanes to use his wind tunnel for free. 
The only condition was that he could publish the most interesting results. So just imagine the huge interest from many builders at the time in coming here to carry out tests, both for free and with Gustave Eiffel there to advise them. All of the big names in aviation came to Eiffel's wind tunnel. They developed everything, the profile of propeller blades of the wings, the shape of the aeroplanes, etc. Here, Eiffel was pioneering. That's what we love about him, that he was a trailblazer in lots of different fields. And he was one of the first, probably the first, to carry out tests to measure the aerodynamics of a car. He also worked on the wind resistance of buildings, and it's quite astonishing because those are the principal activities we use the air tunnel for today. Here we are in the diffuser, Gustave Eiffel's invention that allows us to gently slow down the flow of air between the two meters of the test chamber and the four meters of the fan. So this is the diffuser and we're heading towards the fan. It's the original and weighs seven tons and is four meters in diameter. You don't realize when you're over there, it rotates 280 times a minute, creating a wind of 100 kilometers per hour. You can see it's full size now I'm in front of it, but it didn't seem that big when we were in the test section. You can see that I am outside of the test section, and so I'm not getting any blast of air. The fan will work up to its maximum speed, and when I step back, straight away you can see the flow of air is crossing the room from my left to my right. Here too, Gustave Eiffel was innovative. His wind tunnel was the first to create a perfectly constant wind by sucking air rather than blowing it. His work in this laboratory earned him recognition as one of the fathers of aviation, and in 1913, he received the highest global accolade possible for his research, awarded by the Smithsonian Institution in the United States. Engineer, entrepreneur, researcher. Gustave Eiffel died at the age of 91, after leading a truly exceptional life. He was a genius in the service of technology, who passed various masterpieces on to future generations, such as his famous tower, which celebrated its 130 years in 2019.